Hello and welcome to the online ministry of Give You Baptist Church. I'm Chris Walker and I'm the associate pastor here at Good View. And I want to thank you for taking the time to watch our service. 2020 brought many changes and challenges. As a church, we had to rethink how to best minister to our people and our community. Being in person for church is always going to be our first priority and our goal. However, we realize that streaming our services can be a great ministry help as well. We hope that watching today's service will aid and encourage in your walk with the Lord. If you have a home church, our purpose is not to take you away from worship there, but only to aid as a platform in your continued growth in Jesus Christ. Please let us know if we can assist in any way with your spiritual walk. It's our prayer that God will speak directly to your hearts today. Thank you for joining us today for the church service here at Give You Baptist Church. I've entitled my message today, Is It Easier for a Republican to Go Through an Eye of a Needle Than a Democrat to Enter the Kingdom of God? Now, if that upsets you a little bit, then just switch the parties. Uh, maybe that'll make you feel a little bit better. Let me read it again that way. Is it easier for a Democrat to go through the eye of a needle than a Republican to enter the kingdom of God? You know as well as I know that we're living in very difficult and divisive days in our country. And much of it has to do with the political party that you might be associated with. And so I want to deal with that somewhat controversial issue today. And my message is addressed to those of you who know Jesus Christ as your Savior. The things I'm going to share today is not the answer for our nation or the answer for our world. I don't know that I have any of the answers for that. But for the church, there are certain principles that we must follow as believers. And that's what I want to look at today. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, verse 24, I'll say it again, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. That's sort of where I got my title for my message today, even though, even though the Bible doesn't deal with Democrat or Republican parties. If you go back and read the passage in Matthew chapter 19, we have the story of a rich man who came to Jesus, and he was seeking some spiritual help. He wanted to know what he had to do to go to heaven. Jesus responded to him in a way that most of us would have never responded. He said, you've got to keep the commandments. Well, we know that keeping God's law is not how we go to heaven. It's through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But the Lord was trying to see what this man was really trusting in. His response was as unique as the question that was asked him. He said, I've kept all of these from my youth. And again, we know that's not possible to perfectly keep God's commandments all of our life. I think the guy was probably thinking, I've tried to do right. I've tried to live in a manner that honors God. I'm not perfect, but I try to live by the commandments. Jesus then would then say to him another sort of unique statement. Go sell all you have and come follow me. I have never said that to anybody in ministry. I've never said that to anybody that came forward in a church service. If you want to be saved, go sell everything and come follow me. Sell your house, sell your car, drain your bank account, and then you can become a Christian. I believe the reason Jesus said that is he knew that this young, rich ruler was so given over to his wealth. He didn't want to depart with his possessions. He didn't want to part with them. They had become his God. And Jesus' command to us and God's will for our life is that when we come to him, we give him our all. I've heard preachers say, if the Lord is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. This young man went away sorrowfully, not feeling he could do what the Lord had asked him to do. After he left, the disciples said to Jesus, if he can't be saved, who then? can be saved. And Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. He didn't say it was impossible. He said it was difficult. Uh, the picture that you see is taken about 10 years ago when we were in Israel. 
That's my middle daughter on the other side of the door there. We refer to her as our favorite middle daughter, and we laugh about that. But I remember the guide pointing out to us, he said, do you see the opening in the door? You can see the large door frame and then the opening in the middle. He said, that's called the eye of the needle. And at night when the family was home and they didn't want animals coming into the house, they would open that smaller entrance so especially the larger animals, camels and so forth, couldn't get in. Could a camel possibly get through that opening? Well, they could. They would have to get out on their knees. Somebody would have to unpack all the paraphernalia they might have, and you could maybe squeeze a camel through there. But what Jesus was saying was, as difficult as it is, a camel could go through that, but it would be easier for a camel to go through that small opening than for a rich man trusting in his riches to enter the kingdom of God. And so I would say this concerning the political parties. Can a Republican go to heaven? Absolutely not. Can a Democrat go to heaven? Absolutely not. There will be no Republicans in heaven because they're Republicans. And there will be no Democrats in heaven because they're Democrats. A person goes to heaven because of their faith in Jesus Christ, regardless of what political affiliation they might have. And yet our country is very divided right now along political lines. As a nation, and it's also, I'm seeing, infiltrating into the church. What do Democrats believe? What do Republicans believe? How do they vote? Now, I'm not an expert on either party, but as I have listened and watched and studied some of the platforms that each party has, I want to share some things with you that I hope uh, that you'll be in agreement with, and, and maybe not all these are exactly correct, so don't call me or email me or try to correct any wrong things I'm saying. Understand where I'm coming from, and that is as Christians, we've got to be unified and not divided. In the 2020 election, 70% of evangelical African Americans voted for the Democratic Party. You say, what is an evangelical? An evangelical is a person who claims faith in Jesus Christ, of the authority of the Word of God. Uh, we would identify with them as people who are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so in the 2020 election, and these figures according to what polls you're looking at, may be a little bit differently, but about 70% of African-American people who claim to be Christians voted for the Democratic Party. On the other side of the aisle, in the Republican Party, 75% of white evangelicals voted for the Republican Party. Now, we would be a white evangelical church, not because... We want to be that. That's just the demographics of who we are. And I hope our people, and I believe this to be true, would welcome anybody into our church fellowship. But if these statistics would hold true at our church, then if we have two people attending our church on a regular basis, out of the 200, 150 of them would identify themselves as Republicans, and only 50 would identify themselves as Democrats. How can we be so different in our political party? I believe if you're a Democrat and you're going to an evangelical church, you may find some uh, uncomfortability within that body because of different political agendas or beliefs or platforms. Let me just talk about the Republican Party for just a moment. One of the big issues that most Republicans take a huge stand on and maybe even base their vote on is the issue of abortion. Most Republicans would identify themselves as pro-life. I've even heard preachers say that if you vote for a candidate who is pro-choice, you vote for a murderer. Now, I, I think that's going way too far. But I do believe that the Bible teaches that life begins at conception and that the taking of, a, of, a, of an innocent life is against biblical principles. So most Republicans, not all, but most, would hold to that stance. Most Republicans would hold to small government. That government doesn't need to control our lives and tell us what to do and 
what not to do. They would believe in low taxes. They would believe in gun rights, that we should have the right to own guns and the government shouldn't tell us whether we can or whether we can or what gun we can have or not have. That became a huge issue during the school shootings in our nation's history. Most Republicans believe in a strong military and financially supporting our military. They believe in a strong support of the nation of Israel. Many Republicans today, and I believe this was uh, seen in the march and on the demonstration at the Capitol, believe that the election was stolen. Most Republicans will say that the idea of defunding the police is something that should not be a part of our life. So to different degrees, many in the Republican Party will hold to these platforms to some degree, and I'm sure some other issues as well. Christians in the Democratic Party would talk about a lot of reforms that need to take place, about caring for the poor. That's why you'll see many Democrats hold to higher taxes, that there are people that are rich in our society and they're taking advantage of others and, and we can tax them in a little bit higher bracket and use that money to support people who have it tough in their life and really don't have a chance and are not given opportunities to excel in careers and in education. Many in the Democratic Party are pro-choice. They believe that a woman has the right over her own body and what choice she makes uh, concerning a fetus or a child. A huge issue that many Democrats are going to uh, purport will be health care for all and that we must be careful about health care programs that are being passed that disenfranchise those who have pre-existing conditions. People that will not be allowed to, to get insurance or if they get it, it's going to be in such a high premium that they can't afford it. Global warming is a part of many platforms in the Democratic Party and taking care of our environment and, and the earth that we've been given to live on. Justice for all and criminal justice reform, that people are going to, to jail and prison for minor offenses and, and many African Americans are being shot and killed and they're innocent, they have no guns and if the same situation was a white person, uh, the, the aggravation would be de-escalated some and death wouldn't be the final result. And so both sides have very strong opinions about these issues and why they believe the other side is wrong or why they believe the other side should think differently. And as I said, that has infiltrated our churches and to some extent is beginning to divide the people within a church. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 25 says, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. We must not come to church, wherever your church might be, and have the idea it's us and them. Or we are the Democrats and they are the Republicans, or we are the Republicans and they are the Democrats, and we just can't interact with them, and we have such differences. I don't even know why they come here. I've heard people say that. I've heard people say, how can a Democrat, how can a Christian who's a Democrat ever vote for a Democrat? I've heard Democrats say, how can a person that calls himself a Christian ever vote for the personality that was in the White House? And so you hear on both sides this, this bitterness and this anger and this uh, holding to, to values that they take to be very dear. What are some statements or some thoughts upon which all Christians can agree? I hope the things that I'm going to share now, you can agree with. Now, if you're not a Christian, you may not agree with these things. But as believers in Jesus Christ, I think these are some bedrock principles that we all need to understand as we try to dialogue and work through some of the divide that's happening within the Christian faith and in the Christian church. First of all, people are very passionate about what they believe. Whichever party, they're very passionate about that. And there's nothing wrong with being passionate about what you believe. I think we need to believe strongly 
what we hold dear. But our passion must not spill out into acts of rage and anger and sinfulness. Jesus would say, be angry and sin not. When I was living in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, there was a church in our area, and I didn't know the church, and I didn't know the associate pastor. But there was a girl in his church that was killed by a drunk driver. And he was upset at what had happened and, and how that the, the accident wasn't dealt with in a, in a just manner. And so in his anger, he went downtown to where the boy had bought the, the alcohol, busted all the windows, went inside, busted all the bottles to show his anger and rage against drunk driving. Well, all that did was result in his being arrested. We can, we can be angry or we can be passionate, but we must be very careful how that is played out in our life. And in our today, people are passionate about what they believe in, but they go to extremes that enter into wrong actions. The, the uh, march on the Capitol and entering the Capitol was absolutely something that should not happen. The riots this past summer and, and, and tearing out windows and looting businesses should not happen. Protest and, and sharing what you believe, they, ha they have a place in our country. But we've got to be careful that we don't step out of bounds in our passion and do things that are more harmful than helpful to ourselves or to our political parties or agendas. A second thing I would say is that Christians have different thoughts about political issues. You might think, how can they believe like that? How can they think like that? How can they see that as right? Why don't they see that as wrong? We're going to have differences. My wife and I have a lot of differences, maybe not about political agendas, but even in cleaning our house, we do it different ways. We can't be in the same room and clean at the same time. We found that out early in our marriage. She'll say, why do you do it that way? I'll say, why do you do it that way? And so it's best for us just to clean in different rooms. We get the same result. We just don't have to deal with any anger or bitterness. We bought watches last year. I've got a Fitbit watch. She has an Apple watch, and, and we try to do at least ten to 15,000 steps every day. We even do that differently. She'll step in place while she's watching television. I'll walk around the house. We do that differently. In a political arena, which is of great, greater difference, people have differences. People see things differently. Even people who believe the same Bible come to different conclusions on certain matters. A third thing I would say is that people's thoughts are formed on what they perceive as facts and truth. A lot of the things that are happening in my country my formulation with some of these issues are based on facts that I hear, and the facts may be true or they may not be true. People are so quick to judge a situation before all the facts are in. And sometimes when we get facts, whether it's in the political arena or in, in the life of a church or in your family or in raising your children, you, you are biased in one direction, and then you hear more facts and more information, and hopefully, if something is better, you'll change your viewpoint on something or your approach on something. It happens in jobs all the time, and it should take place. There's a lot of bickering back and forth, and I'm seeing more of that now. We've heard, don't listen to fake news. We've heard that for months from the Republican Party. Now I'm hearing from the Democratic Party, the news agency saying, this particular national uh, broadcast or, or television news broadcast is nothing but lies. And so both are calling each other liars. You're going to have to determine for yourself what is factual, what is truth. We are swayed by news. I mean, if you're a Republican, you probably watch Fox News. If you're a Democrat, you probably watch CNN, and you probably don't watch the other. It's just, it's just the bias, and we're influenced by personalities and news anchors and were influenced by uh, Facebook posts and people in authority, whether that's an educator or maybe a book that we read or, or somebody that has great charisma. Now, these can have their place, but we've got to know what we believe for ourselves. Why do we believe what we believe, whatever it is? God has commanded believers to love one another. 
when the Apostle John wrote 1 John, he said this, Don't tell me you love God and hate your brother or sister. And that's why the message today I'm bringing is for believers. We may have differences on many issues, but what draws us together is our relationship to Jesus Christ. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, and the love of Christ must flow through us to others, even in our differences. Don't tell me you love God and not love your brother and sister and not treat them in a kind and loving manner. I believe it's important that we understand what we believe and we're able to explain what we believe in a loving manner. The Bible talks about, concerning biblical truth, that we are to speak the truth in love. I'm not saying or hinting in any way that as Christians we need to compromise what we believe and not hold to what we believe so that we can be together as one. That's the last thing I would say. But why do you believe what you believe, especially in the political agenda? Can you express yourself or are you just repeating what you've heard somebody else say? We must be able to know why we believe this is right or this is wrong, and express it in a loving way. We are getting away from dialogue. If somebody doesn't believe like we believe, we don't want to have any part with them. We don't want to have any fellowship with them. We don't want to even be in their presence. We want to take our ball and go home. That is not what Christ wants, and that is not what the church should be about. We need to affirm others' value, even if we disagree with them. We may disagree with their viewpoint, but we have to value who they are. No matter whether a person is a Christian or not a Christian, they are made in the image of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he didn't die for Democrats and he didn't die for Republicans. He died for the world. And that's the love that we must have. We must value people, even if we have differences with them. I hope these are some statements that all, that all of us can agree with. But let's talk about some positive steps that Christians and churches can take. Now, again, this is not an exhaustive list, and maybe some of the things that I say can be tweaked a little bit. This is not perfect. I'm just trying to give us some type of starting point to heal these wounds that are growing even within the family of God. And I really just alluded to this one in the last statement, but we must see Christians as fellow believers, not as Democrats and Republicans. We must not come to church and say, you know, that's a Democrat over there. You know that person over there, did you hear what they said? They've got to be a Republican. And it's a, it's a them and us mentality. I don't believe that has any place in the Christian life. Here's what we should be saying. You know, they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're my brother in Christ. You know, they were saved last week. That's my sister in Christ. We're part of the same family, and blood should be thicker than water, as the saying goes. Another thing that I think is important and, and is lacking, and, and we have to have some type of form for this to happen, but we need to talk and share what we believe and why we believe, and we also need to listen to opposing views. One of the things that I do as a pastor is I try to listen to several cable network agencies. I want to see what both are saying because when I deal with people, I don't want to come from just one viewpoint and not understand what the other viewpoint is. Can you honestly listen to people who have opposing views in you? Or when they talk, are you just saying, go ahead and say what you're going to say because I'm going to come right back at you and you don't even listen to what they say. There may be some truths and some concepts that the opposing party has that you might need to hear and that you might need to think about. And it might change maybe the way you think about an issue, but surely the way you think about somebody else. Appreciate them for who they are. We must always show or speak the truth in love and show respect. I see a society outside the church that, is, that are demonizing people who don't believe, with, believe like they do. I hear statements from both parties that are just so far out of bounds. 
It's ridiculous. I, again, I've already mentioned this, but compromising what you believe is not the Christian thing to do. We just all have to get together. No, we've got we've to take a stand on the Word of God and the truth of the Word of God. Don't compromise truth. Would you, in your heart, as you think about these issues, would you honestly search your heart? I'm afraid, and I've said this statement before, that some people within the church are more loyal to their political party than they are to Jesus Christ. This message today is focused a lot on politics, and that is not normally what I do. Usually I'll take a passage of Scripture, and we'll just deal with the spiritual lessons. But I believe in the day that we're living, this is a message that Christians need to hear because the respect and love and honoring other people's value as Christians is something that is not what it should be and must be built back up. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35, and this is really the thought behind this whole message. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another. There are people that live outside of our church wall that are not Christians. They don't go to church. But they see Christians fighting and bickering back and forth, and they're thinking, if that's what church is like, why even go? They get the idea that we're just a bunch of hypocrites, and in some ways we are, if that's the attitude we have toward others. So search your heart. When you come to church Sunday, if you know somebody is of the opposing party, show love to them. Don't try to ignore them or run away from them or demean them in any manner. Be careful about the things you post on Facebook. I believe in our passion, people are posting things that are sharing their viewpoints, but it's very demeaning to others who are watching it. I see very little settle on Facebook. People write what they think, and then they say, don't even respond back because I'm not going to read it. What kind of dialogue is that? So when I'm talking about dialogue, I'm surely not talking about dialogue on Facebook. I'm talking about a church. We've got to think about ways that we can come together and share differences, and still love and respect each other, because we're not here in this kingdom of God to promote a government or a government leader. We're here to share Jesus Christ and to promote the kingdom of God. One day the king of kings is coming, and he's going to take his place in the seat on the throne in Jerusalem, and he's going to rule in righteousness. But until he comes, our responsibility as Christians is to live like Christ, and share the gospel with those who don't know him. Good day. The Lord bless you. Let me share one thing before I pray. I hope you'll stay around and listen to the music. As we've said before, we've changed the formats of our services. The music follows and then the announcements. I trust that you'll be involved in some of the things that are coming up, especially our time of prayer next Saturday. We're going to meet here at the church at 8 o'clock. Uh, We're going to talk about prayer. We're going to listen to some messages on prayer, and we're going to break up in prayer groups. If you have some specific prayer requests you'd like for our church to pray for, if you'll call the church and let us know, we'll write those down. We'll take them into our prayer groups, and we will pray for your need this coming Saturday. After that, we're going to have communion. We're going to share communion, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ that was shed for us. That makes us one. We're also going to be talking about how we can take... uh, the communion service into the homes of those who can't get out and come to a church service. So if if that is interesting to you or of an interest to you, let us know as well. Let me close my time in prayer. Father, we need your grace and we need your mercy and we need your wisdom because there are some very deep, passionate thoughts and even hurts on the hearts of your people. There is some ill will that is going on because of political differences. And we have so much more to be in agreement with according to the Scriptures and the truth of God. Lord, don't let our flesh and don't let Satan come in and divide us because a a kingdom divided against itself or a, 
a family divided against itself or a, a church divided against itself cannot stand. We've not addressed all the issues today, nor do we know all the issues. But what I know is the world is watching. And they need to see Christians who genuinely love each other. And though we may have differences, may we express those in a way that's Christ-like, even though we may be passionate about those. May we always walk together as one as we strive to reach our community and our world for Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you.
Yo quiero 